Hi guys, that's right. I'm here with Bob Harvey and I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Um, obviously this fire started in your district and you were also, you were just telling me you were one of the first to see it and also report it, right? Yes, I was uh, doing some work in, uh, in a visual position to be able to see the first puffs of smoke coming up. And so of course with the weather conditions, quickly called the dispatch and told them there was a fire. I gave them an approximate area because I couldn't see exactly where it was. How quickly were you guys able to get onto that fire? I would think that our engines, uh, and, and I haven't back checked back on the records at this point, but we're with, on it within five to six minutes. Wow, and so then um, just talk to me a little bit about the conditions that day. I know it was really windy and, and how that played against you guys. Yeah, of course it was very windy and it was in, uh, topographically, it was in a drainage area uh, below some houses. And so we tend to get erratic winds within that kind of a drainage system, with the, especially with the type, fuel types, with the oak and the, the tall shrubs, grasses. And so it wants to move very quickly through that fuel type. At what point during that fire did you realize we need help, you know, this is, this is out of our hands? Well, we did uh, attempt with all the resources that were coming in, the stuff that I, the resources I knew that were coming in, we did make some very strong and serious rapid attempts to get control. And by the time it had um, engaged, started to engage Milam Road, which was about uh, oh, almost three quarters of a mile that we, we had only made very small gains. Uh, and they didn't seem as significant enough as when the uh, conversation between myself, the county, and the state occurred when we could get everybody together and make the determination that it would be turned over. Did you ever think that it would get to where it is now? I mean, 400 homes, I mean, seen it that first day, did you ever think it would get to this? No, of course, it's always our fear that it will get that, that large of, of a fire. and. Uh, you know, it was always my hope that we could back off to one of the larger roads, such as Milam, and uh, contain it to, to one side of the roadway. And, uh, but due to the fuel loading within the Black Forest and the encroachment of trees on, along the roadway and no adequate clearances, we couldn't use any kind of a fuel break to uh, bring this fire to ground. So it was moving full canopy height. We were seeing flame lengths of uh, 300 feet. Uh, coming across those roadways at us and so a lot of times the, the firefighters really went to extremes to the point of uh, rescuing people and uh, we had a couple of fire engines that were slightly damaged as they got scorched. Well, how quickly was the fire moving? The fire seemed to be, well it, it, it would vary by the wind because wind would shift on us constantly uh, but I think it must have crossed uh, black it felt like it crossed the full width of eight miles of black forest in, in a matter of uh, five hours. Wow. And you were saying earlier you've responded to a lot of fires, but this one was particularly difficult because this is your community. That's right. Uh, I haven't been the, the chief very long of black forest, but I've been to a lot of wildland fires. I'm, I'm a nationally mobilized division supervisor, uh, incident commander type three and structure protection specialist. and. Uh, and so when I go to other communities and work the, the program to defend structures, it's a much different a feeling than it is the people that I'm with every day. And so uh, your perspective changes. What message do you want to get out to your community and to those people in that area? Well, first of all, I, I really wish we could have done more. But that was absolutely impossible. There it was no resources available in the in the realm of firefighting that would have really changed the dynamic. When we finally did get the air tanker support, uh, it was only marginally effective on one very small portion of the fire, but on the flame front, it, there was no chance that it was ever going to be effective. And uh, just the ability to compete for resources with many fires going on in the area and a limited air tanker fleet, it just puts us behind the power curve on being able to get resources on it. If I'd had an air tanker that was on it within the first eight minutes to 10 minutes, it probably would have made a difference, but that's not a reality in the Pikes Peak region. Air tankers are not stationed here and their flight time far exceeds that. So uh, whenever there's these situations, there's always those people that ask, well, why wasn't more done at the beginning? What else could have been done? Why wasn't it stopped yeah. sooner? You're just saying it, it wasn't possible. It, was, it would not have been possible. If I would have lined up 200 fire engines, we would not have stopped it. It was of such intensity and it was being pushed by the wind so strongly into the volatile forest. So what we need is the people that lived in the forested areas 
to take it, the responsibility to thin the forest, reduce the ladder fuels, clean up all of those litter fuels that carry the fire and cause it to spread. We have a regional issue, and we saw it last year with the Waldo Canyon fire, and we see it this year with the Black Forest fire, and we only have to guess where it's going to happen next. Are we going to devastate the entire region, or are we going to take personal responsibility for making a fire wise and what, what ends up being a healthier forest? So as, as an expert, as these people are returning home to this area and, you know, just any area, should they really be looking around at their house and saying, you know, what can I do to help? What can I do to keep this from happening here to my home? Oh, very strongly. I, that should be the family commitment for the next few months is to reduce the fire potential. And we do have the FireWise program as well as the Ready, Set, Go pro program that uh, develops the awareness and develops the tools and methodology uh, to reduce the fire threat to your house. And Ready, Set, Go is also a program that gives you guidance on what to prepare for evacuation and lets you establish benchmarks of saying, well, if the fire is this distance, then we should be packed and ready to go and we should leave when it's at this distance. So these are the kind of tools that we do have available in most of the fire departments within the front range to help people de develop this plan. We cannot do all the evacuations, we cannot do all the fire suppression uh, with the limited resources that we have. That's why we depend on our brothers and sisters in the blue uniformist off, uh, law enforcement officers to carry out the evacuations because we are trying desperately to suppress that fire. Thank you so much. Anything else that you want to add? I just want everybody to be safe out there and think about the cancellations for the 4th of July for the fireworks shows, they're absolutely necessary. I want to thank all of the uh, fire agencies that help and all of the volunteers that are pouring out. Uh, we saw such tremendous help from Colorado Springs, huge commitment from, from Chief Smith of the Colorado Springs Fire Department in supporting our operations. Uh, Chief Burns from uh, Donald Westcott, Chief Trudy from Tri Lakes, Chief Levy from Falcon, Chief Love from Cimarron Hills. My wife and daughters, they've been wonderful in this. So. <laughs> I thank everybody. Thank you so much for yeah, your time. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. Um, so there you guys have it. Some of the, some insight into the start of this fire and what it was really like out there. I know we all always ask those questions. Why couldn't we stop it sooner? Why couldn't more be done? And you're hearing it straight from the source as to, as to how difficult that fire really and how quickly that fire really got out of hand.